seems indefinite, even forever. You're watching Revelation, understanding world events from the past to the present and into the future. My guest today is author and teacher Barry Smith. He has written several books, mainly focusing on the New World Order. However, as Barry has many years of studying about eschatology, that is, understanding end-time prophecies, he will no doubt talk to us about how New World Order fits in perfectly with Bible prophecies which are having fulfillment before our very eyes. Welcome to the program, Barry. Thank you, Ed. This is not the first time that we've met, but there will be perhaps people watching the program who've uh, never really seen you or heard about your uh, understandings of world events. And it's with that in mind that perhaps you could uh, just bring us up to date with, from your perspective on how the New World Order fits into what's happening today. I was a school teacher 15 years, Howard, and I one day was travelling home with a friend. Um, he asked me a question about the common market as he had been teaching this during his classes. And uh, I said, I don't know much about it. He said, is it in the Bible prophecies? I said, I don't know. So that started me off. I began to look into the scriptures. I found at a certain time in history, there would be 10 nations would come together and control the economy of the world. Um, I learned that there would be a great world leader arise called Antichrist. I learned that there would be a one world money system called the Mark of the Beast. That's how I got started. Um, and then in the year 1990, George Bush uttered a very strange phrase. Do you remember the New World Order? Just as he introduced the Gulf War, he kept using this phrase, New World Order. And flying out of, um, one day I was flying out of San Diego for Texas, I picked up a copy of the LA Times and in there it said, George Bush and his New World Order. People do not really understand what it is. And as they went around asking his staff, what is the meaning of the New World Order? None of them knew. They said the president keeps using the phrase, but we're not sure if what it is is what we think it is or what the president thinks it is. Now we happen to know what it is now. It is a satanic Luciferian plan for the takeover of the whole world and its population. And they want to bring it to some sort of completion by the end of this year. Now that's why it's called by George Bush, New World Order and Jimmy Carter before him, Global 2000. In other words, at the end of this millennium, which is this year, the new millennium starts, of course, on the 1st of January 2001, according to the Royal Observatory up the, Thames, uh, up the River Thames at Greenwich. You talk about the New World Order uh, defined, as you have, as being Luciferian. Yes. Um, how, do we, how do you know that? Well, my investigations led me to look at the back of the American dollar, and I found these strange seals on the dollar here. When we go to the States speaking on these subjects, I, I say to the Americans, have you seen these seals before? They say, no. I say, but they've been on your dollar since 1933. How come you've never seen them? They're Illuminati seals, which was a secret society set up in 1776 by a man called Adam Weishaupt, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica. Now, Weishaupt was an ex-Jesuit priest who had an aim, was to put Lucifer on the throne of the world. And on the back of the dollar here, you see the seal on the left-hand side, and there's an eye in the triangle, which many Americans presume to be the eye of God, but it's not. It's the eye of Horus in Egyptian mythology, now called the eye of Lucifer or Satan. Now, we can establish that fact because the God that we serve does not have one eye, of course. He's not a cyclops. It says the eyes, plural, of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. Anybody who is familiar with um, witchcraft will know that that eye... Uh, when you open it a little bit is the eye of psychic knowledge. When you open it completely and it is illumined as this one is, it is the eye of Lucifer himself who was the god of Freemasonry, the god of witchcraft and the god of the occult or esoteric practice. The, then you have the 13 layers of stone on the pyramid and people should be asking the question, what is an Egyptian pyramid doing on the back of an American dollar? What link up is there between America and uh, Egypt? The answer is none at all except in the field of the occult. And I discovered that the 13 layers of stone there stand for the 13 layers in Freemasonry, which is very much involved in this plan to set up the Novus Ordo Seclorum, which is a one world government. Then you have at the bottom 1776, the date was uh, May the 1st, when the Illuminati was inaugurated in Bavaria, not July the 4th, the Declaration of Independence, as many Americans presume. The two words at the top, annua chapters, stand for announcing the birth of, and down the bottom, novus ordo seclorum. 
The word novus in Latin stands for new. The word ordo means order. And the word seclorum is where we get our word secular from, the absence of God. And thus we see that eye cannot be the eye of God, for why would he be setting up a, 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 a new system, complete world government, in, with the absence of himself as being in power? And thus we see we're dealing with a Luciferian plan. On the other side, we have the so-called American eagle, which we discover is not an eagle at all. According to the witchcraft people, that is a phoenix. And the phoenix, as we all know, was a mystical bird that rose out of the ashes of the Tower of Babel. Man's first attempt, Tower of Babel. God smashed it, failed. Second attempt, new world order. I predict God will smash it, but it will reign for three and a half years and the whole world system will come under its power. It's starting right now, Howard. People may also be thinking, well, does it really matter that these are on the back of an American dollar or any other currency for that matter? What is the significance? I wouldn't have known the answer to that question had I not had meetings in Seattle, Washington. One afternoon I was walking into a building and a girl came in carrying a large volume called The Secret Teachings of All Ages by Manley Hall, a top Freemason writer. And when I saw the book, I got excited. I said, how much for your book, dear? She said, $20. So I paid her 20 American and I got the book. And I trust she bought another one. When I took that book home, I discovered much of the answers to my problems. Um, for example, he said there in that book that when America was settled, it was settled by two groups of people, the Pilgrim Fathers, and that's why we read here, in God we trust, they settled America for religious freedom. He said at the same time, a group of occultists and Freemasons settled it for a peculiar and a particular purpose known only to the initiated few. The initiated few are called in Freemasonry in the top degrees, the adepts, the elect and the sages. These men settled it for the main purpose of putting Lucifer, the god of Freemasonry, on the throne of the world. And it is significant that next month, in the month of uh, well, November, whenever this program comes out on television, people need to recognise the American elections this time are very important indeed, as either uh, Gore or Bush will lead the world into this peculiar and particular purpose for which America was set up which is to lead the whole world system into a one world government, a one world religion, a one world law system, and a one world money system that the Bible calls the mark of the beast. I would think that if the free, any Freemason was watching, they would be very upset about what you're saying. Um, how can you be sure that the Freemasons are at the bottom of this? The United States of America is the only country in the world, uh, the only republic in the world that is completely controlled by Freemasonry. Uh, a careful reading of my books will show you that the uh, map of Washington, D.C. has the Freemason symbols built into the streets. We, have you ever seen that? I did it last time I was here in England. And anybody who would like to argue the toss about that should go to the library and get a picture of Washington, D.C., a map, and check out. You'll see the compass built into the streets. One end of the compass finishes at the Jefferson Memorial. The other end finishes at the White House. They will see the square intersecting it further up on the map of Washington. And then they will see the satanic pentagram built into the streets of Washington, D.C. also. And if you look at it carefully, you'll see the two horns go uppermost, the two ears outwards, and the beard of the goat, which fits into the pentagram, the five-pointed star. Anybody into witchcraft knows this. The beard stops right at the White House again. So the, the presidency of America is affected by witchcraft from two different directions, the point of the end of the compass and also the point of the beard of the goat. Those that are into witchcraft, you say, would recognise this, but for the majority of the people out there, they're not into witchcraft, so they're probably still not seeing the significance of this. So, and if they are, they, they, well, they would better have a, an understanding if they could look at a reference book that was independent. Is, are there such... There is, there, yes, people just need to get onto the net and they'll discover the answers to these questions. People today, of course, are very fortunate they can check all this information out. We had a man in New Zealand who listened to what I said once and as an accountant he felt he had a responsible position. He said, this man is talking absolute nonsense. He got so angry about it, went home, began to look it up and discovered it was all happening. In other words, what I'm saying here is that people into Freemasonry shouldn't be angry. They should be very grateful that I'm telling them they're into a witchcraft system. Any man who joins, of course, knows you do the cutting of the throat, 
symbolically speaking, the ripping of the chest, the pulling out of the heart, the cutting of the stomach, the pulling out of the bowels, the falling into the coffin, carried around the lodge in a coffin painted on a sheet, a miraculous resurrection, death blows to, uh, to the head are counteracted by a resurrection akin to the resurrection of Jesus, and the kissing of the Bible, sealing each, each oath uh, on a witchcraft uh, system, it's, it's evil. And therefore, men uh, all over the world are grateful when I explain to them the esoteric or witchcraft nature of Freemasonry. Most of them see it as a benevolent society that helps build hospitals, old people's homes and so on. But that's simply the outer portico. As a Christian man and a speaker worldwide, I need to tell people there is an inner area that they know nothing about. And as a Christian, I must warn them, it is deadly, very deadly indeed, regarding the salvation of one's soul to belong to a system like that, that proclaims in the upper degrees, Lucifer is God. The average Freemason wouldn't know that. He would say that, that he would deny that, that Lucifer is the head of that organization. Yes, um, we discovered that uh, Freemasonry is a system which believes in a dual God, dualistic system. Uh, dualism means that in Eastern philosophy and religion, they believe you have to have an opposite for everything. For example, if you have black, you have white. If you have light, you must have darkness. If you have a male, you must have a female. If you're a Chinese, you have a yin, you must have a yang. In the case of God, they come up against a brick wall because God does not have an opposite. So they invent an opposite, they call him Lucifer. And the statement made by Albert Pike many years ago, a top Freemason in America, said these words, what we must say to the crowd is, we worship a God, but it is the God which one adores without superstition. Do you sovereign grand inspectors general, we say this, and you may repeat it to the brethren of the 30th, 31st and 32nd degrees. The Masonic religion should be by all of us initiates maintained in the purity of the Luciferian doctrine. If Lucifer were not God, would the God of the Christians bother to spread false and harmful statements about him? Yes, Lucifer is God. But then he goes on to say Adonai is also God, unfortunately. And then he said there must be two gods to bring about perfection, you see. And then they change the roles of these gods. They say Adonai is the dark side of God and Lucifer is the God of light and brightness. In other words, they blaspheme as they call the God of Israel the dark side and Lucifer their God, the bright side of the Godhead. Uh, men are not told this until they get into the upper degrees, you see, above the 30th degree. How many other degrees are there before then, before one is brought uh, into the knowledge of who is in control of that? Well, a, a man should smell a rat by the first degree as soon as he does the, uh, the hood over the, over the eyes called hoodwinking, uh, a noose around his neck. Any Freemason watching this program knows I'm telling the truth. I've, I've met so many of them. In fact, I've sat there with them, with their wives sitting next to them, and their wives saying, you didn't. And the poor man doesn't know what to do. He said, I did, dear. There's a noose around their neck. Their shirt is rolled up uh, above the chest. They're pricked with the point of a sword. And they're told that if they run forward, they'll be, hung, they'll be stabbed by the sword. If they run backwards, they'll be hung by the running noose. And while they're in that dreadful position, they do these witchcraft symbolic cutting of the throat and so on. So any man who does that, who's in his right mind, should say there's something wrong here. They should smell a rat. And of course, it is witchcraft from start to finish. How are they going to be used to bring about this new world order then? Well, the, the point is that Washington DC, with the Masonic symbols built into the streets, uh, has a very powerful witchcraft spirit over it. Now, anybody listening to what I'm saying today who doesn't believe in spiritual matters, of course, wouldn't understand. It says the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit. Is there some sort of conspiracy then uh, between certain world leaders that will bring about this new world order? There is a power group at the top, obviously, who are running the whole thing, pulling the strings. And I have discovered, for example, that um, uh, Mr. Tony Blair is not running this country. I learned that he is controlled by a group called the City. Um, right in the middle of London you have a group here which, which control the politics of this country. And if the Queen, for example, wishes to go in there, she must receive permission from the Lord Mayor, who will then give her permission to go into the city. It's like an entity on its own. Um, they go along with a group called the Adam Smith Institute. They work with another group called the Mont Pelerin Society. 
uh, they send the message out on um, restructuring the whole world system ready for this world government to the politicians of the day. Tony Blair, uh, Helen Clark in New Zealand, uh, Mr Howard in Australia. These people listen to the Mont Pelerin Society, use the policies of the Adam Smith Institute, which mean that you privatise, you, you sell up your assets overseas, it leaves your government vulnerable, they have no power left because they have no assets, and then at that point these overseas people who bought the assets control the whole world system and set up a global village. In the year 1961, the International Monetary Fund came to New Zealand. Um, and this is how the whole plan was initiated. Th they were involved in this plan, and the plan was to lend every country money and then make those politicians of the day sign conditions, which would later be fulfilled. So in 1961, they came to New Zealand. Our Prime Minister was Mr Keith Holyoke. Our government borrowed a lot of money from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and signed the conditions. Then the IMF uh, and, uh, people went away again with their empty suitcases, left it at that, and uh, let us go ahead with our plans to uh, develop our country and so on using this money which we had borrowed. Now, little did the people know that when those politicians passed on, someone else took the job. The next group of politicians to come in were left with the terrible job of fulfilling the conditions. It happened about 22 years later, I think it was, in 19... Uh, uh, seven, sorry, 1987, that's the year, we had, we had five politicians in New Zealand worked in with the Mont Pelerin Society to bring about these conditions in the country. Now, let me read a scripture, Proverbs 22, 7. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. That's a powerful verse. In other words, we became the lender, the borrower, the IMF was the lender, and we had to do what they told us to do. We, we've heard these words come up day by day. Restructuring was the first word. Didn't know what it meant, but we learnt later it meant sacking thousands of government workers. The next word was corporatisation. Turn your government departments into corporations. Next word to come up was privatisation. means privatise those corporations. Get big business involved in ex-government departments. Selling off. Selling off. Next word was shares at 49% overseas, keeping 51% majority shareholding in the country. We felt secure. I was in Sri Lanka last year. They told me that was called peopleisation. Every country's got their own little catchword, you see. Peopleisation makes the local people feel secure in that they have 51%. Very cleverly, a little stock market crash in New York, which lasts for 24 hours, frightens the peopleisation people. They sell their shares to the other guys, and the other guy's shareholding goes up to over 51%. At that point, what was owned by your country, paid for with your father's tax money, your grandfather's tax money, now goes into overseas hands, never to return again. So the key word, when you see privatisation, you add another word to it, and the word is goodbye, and the other word is forever. You will never see it again. Then they bring investors in, of course, because you've lost your assets and you've paid off the IMF with the money you've made, you've got nothing left, no assets and no money. Investors come in and buy up the rest of your country. This is uh, globalisation, to set up a global village. Now, if you look on the back of the dollar, you see that the words there, Novus Ordo Seclorum, mean a secular, heathenistic, new world order, which is a government and so on. Now, in the case of this new world order, they use the analogy of the building of a house. Now, when you build a house, you have a foundation, and if anybody who is watching this program has a pen and paper, I suggest you get it out and write down what I'm saying now. 1776 was the foundation of the whole deal. The Luciferian plan was devised by one, Adam Weishaupt, we've dealt with him, in Bavaria. Those seals were designed by his designers, carried across the Atlantic in the year 1778, handed to Thomas Jefferson, a very powerful politician in America, who received the two seals from a hooded messenger who carried the seals in a velvet bag. He never discovered who that man was. The only seal that has been used up to this point in history was the so-called eagle, but the other one was hidden until 1933 when Franklin Delano Roosevelt had that put on the back of the American dollar. Now we have two seals. Anybody who's interested to do this, photograph these seals, put them on a transparency, cut the transparency in half, lay one on half of the other, on, on top of the other, 
and discover that these seals are full of Masonic and witchcraft symbolism. So the foundation of the house was 1776, May the 1st. When you build a house, you then put up the framework. That was 1987 in New Zealand under the Labour government. Five men brought the plan to pass without even telling the rest of the Labour Party what they were doing. They tried it first of all with Margaret Thatcher here in Great Britain. She didn't get very far with it. The people didn't like it, so she was finally sacked from the job she went. They then moved to New Zealand because we're a very slack little country. The motto in New Zealand, she'll be right. The Australian motto, very similar, she'll be right, mate, you see. So they did that to us. Now, when you've put the framework of the house up, who comes next? Answer the electrician. And then, of course, at the end of 1999, the Y2K bug came upon us. Everybody was terrified. And a man called John Koskinen in America controlled 25 groups for fixing the Y2K problem. These 25 groups worldwide were the electrician that were going to be used to set up the electricity for the New World Order as they wired this house. Now, this is what he did very cleverly. He, um, through fear, let it be known that there was a terrible problem, which was true. It cost them 650 billion American dollars to fix the problem. The problems are outlined in my books there. We all thought the whole world was going down. Howard, did you think that here? Well, I personally didn't because I know the prophecies in the Bible. And, okay. uh, but um, many, many people did. They were extremely concerned because they started to stockpile food and uh, you know, take other precautions. They did. Ready for some sort of crash. Once the framework of the house is up, the next thing to do is to bring in the electrician to wire the house. The Y2K bug, so-called, or the Millennium Bug, was the wiring of the New World Order house. Um, at the end of 1999, on December the 31st, you remember at midnight, the changeover came. We had zero, zero on many of the world's computers. Now, th through fear, the governments of the world were forced to upgrade their computers, whether they could afford to do it or not. Very poor countries in Africa, South America, and so on, all went along with the plan. And when they upgraded their computers through fear, although it cost the world government people $650 billion to do this, along with the people who were working with them, John Koskinen, the man in charge, was in ch made sure that everybody had things compatible, ready for the new world order and the new money system. Let me read from this article given to us from a friend in Ireland. It's called Moving the World Electronically into World Government. Comes out from Southwest Radio Ministries, Prophetic Observer, and the article is written by Joan Vion. I quote in part, Y2K was the wiring of the house, as the structure had already been built for some time. Y2K provided the excuse to transfer the world from individual nation states into an electronically knit world, a world which is now one and includes both governments and corporations. From the beginning of January the 1st, 2000, we entered an electronic world government. Now, Howard, here's the shocking statement. I turn the page and I've underlined this in red. Koska Ken boasted further, as reported in USA Today, solving Y2K proved that I can run the world with four people. There it is. All they need now is the roof on the house, and that is the worldwide money crash, which is to come shortly. Did he have access through what he did then to the computers, to everyone's computers now? Or yes, the whole thing now is linked electronically because they made them compatible. They upgraded them, whether they could afford to or not. They went into debt if necessary to upgrade all these computers. And I speak of the, uh, the big X... Um, the old government computers that were being used for many, many years. Let me read now from the scriptures. I, I, uh, we're dealing with Bible prophecy here. The Word of God in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 says shortly, and I'm speaking about the future now, a great world leader will arise who's called by at least four names. He's called Antichrist, the beast, the man of sin, and the son of perdition, who will bring about a mystery situation in the world called the mystery of iniquity, which is simply the takeover of everybody's lives from the cradle to the grave. Let me read. Verse 6, And now you know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. That's Antichrist. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. There is something stopping this man being revealed at the moment. But during the course of our lectures, I point out that we will recognize him 
in four ways. Number one, he will be a non-religious Jewish man. Now, by saying that, I'm not anti-Jewish. In fact, I'm very pro-Jewish. We are friends with many Jewish folk. We take tours every year there. But this man must of necessity be a Jew because Jesus himself was a Jew. He's going to be called the Antichrist or one who takes the place of Christ. The Jews at the moment are looking for a Messiah uh, and they're going to get one shortly and his name will be called, well, Antichrist. He's called the beast, man of sin, son of perdition. This man must be Jewish. John 5, 43 points this out in a very subtle way. Jesus said, I am come in my Father's name, you receive me not. Another shall come in his own name, and him you will receive. It's no use a red Indian turning up and saying to the Jewish people, I'm your Messiah. They wouldn't accept him. Secondly, we read in the prophet Daniel, chapter 11, 37, about this man's non-religious nature. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, that's Yahweh, the Jewish God, in the Amplified Bible, it says, nor him to whom women desire to give birth. Who did every Jewish girl want to give birth to? Answer? The Messiah. The Messiah. This man will not regard the Messiah nor any other God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Point number two, we then turn to Revelation chapter 17. We see that he will have control over the European Union shortly. Now, the European Union has been run, as you know, you're part of it here, by, first of all, a council of ministers, they criticised them. They called them a bunch of champagne charlies who were using community funds for their own good. Uh, they sacked them and brought about a European Parliament. That is not much better. Ultimately, the Word of God predicts they will get one man, a dictator, who will run the whole show. Revelation chapter 17, verses 10 and 11 speak of this man who will come. Number three, this man will be in charge of a peace treaty which will be conducted in the Middle East and no one else is bringing it about, that's for sure. Watching the television news, what do we see? Stones flying in all directions, guns firing and so on. We need a man of great power and charisma to bring about this peace treaty between the Jews and the Arabs. In Daniel 9, 27, point number three, this man will bring about a seven-year treaty. He will break it after three and a half years and we will recognize him because he must be this world leader who will arise. Number four, he will bring about a new world money system spoken of in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 16 to 18, called the mark of the beast, where a silicon chip will be implanted in people's right hands or foreheads for buying and selling. I have all the information on the table here, and in further broadcast, no doubt, we can talk about those things. But we are living at the end of a generation, and Jesus said, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Exciting? It is, Barry. Uh, thank you that you, you're so explicit in your understanding of world events, particularly from a biblical perspective. We'll continue this discussion and hopefully we'll come to a better understanding of where we are in the human history. Thank you for watching Revelation. You're watching Revelation, understanding world events from the past to the present and into the future. Our guest today again is author and teacher Barry Smith. He's written several books, mainly focusing on the New World Order. However, as Barry has many years of studying about eschatology, that is understanding end time prophecies, he will no doubt talk to us again about how the New World Order fits in perfectly with biblical prophecies which are having fulfillment in our day. Barry, we're, the previous programs were talk, still talking about um, the New World Order and want to know really how America fits into this. Many people have said that America is not mentioned in the prophecies, but having read some books by others, such as David Wilkerson and others who have seen visions and uh, God has revealed certain things to them, the suggestion has been made that Revelation 18 is a picture in part of Mystery Babylon, eco economically speaking and politically speaking. We know that Revelation 17 is the city of Rome, the city of the seven hills, uh, that's very clear, the headquarters of the World Church, which will be a combination of uh, Catholicism, Protestantism, Eastern religion, and so on. Now, Revelation 18, I'm quoting from verse 10, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And the suggestion has been made, and I agree with this, that this refers to New York City, the home of Wall Street, the home of the uh, United Nations. And then we read in verse 17, for in one hour 
so great a riches has come to naught. Every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? In one of my books, I have 25 reasons why that refers to New York. And a careful reading of Revelation 18 shows that uh, there's something going to happen there. Wilkerson, a great man of God, I believe, in New York, the author of The Cross and the Switchblade, David Wilkerson, said this, that uh, Saddam Hussein, for one, is threatening America, in particular New York City, to give them a hard time. He said, America's given me a hard time. I'll send in bubonic plague. Um, I'll send in all sorts of uh, plagues with these chemicals and biological weapons that cannot be traced at airports and flood the sewers of New York and cities like that with, say, bubonic plague, let the rats pick it up, carry it. And then we quote from Revelation 18 and verse 8. Listen to this. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death um, and, and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong as the Lord God who judgeth her. I don't want to be seen as a doomsday man, Howard, but... Um, it does apparently come across like that. Not too good, it? is it? <laughs> I mean, what happened here in London in 1666? Remember? Great fire, fire. in London. Why? Because Bubonic of the plague. plague. Mm -hmm. So the only way to cleanse a city from that particular problem is fire. Just an interesting scripture that's worth observing. Now, in America at the moment, we have the elections coming up. You've got Bush and Gore. And the, the one that I'm hedging my bets on, and I'm not really a betting man, but if I was to use the phrase, would be uh, Bush. Bush, of course, belongs to a society that his father belonged to before him and his father before him. The name of the society is called the Skull and Bones, sometimes called the Order, uh, sometimes called 322. It has German origins. It has a swastika on the wall. Can you believe this? And their meeting hall at Yale University, they have the skulls of such famous personalities as uh, uh, the Indian chief, what was his name, Geronimo. And they've got all these bones and so on in there. And they have a very strange initiation system. Now, remember that George W. Bush, the man who's going for the presidency next month, in the month of November, belongs to the society. In order to get into it, you've got to go through an inauguration system where you go through a ceremony like being locked in a tomb, uh, until you scream your head off with fear and they wrestle in a bath of mud these are some of the initiations in the nude mind you excuse me um, the other one is to lie in a coffin also unclosed and tell the secrets of your past life to the other 14 members of the club which means that any time in the future when you go against the plans that they have for a one world government where do you get this information from it's, it's, it seems barbaric and it seems quite it is out of character with the sort of picture you have of these these men they don't tell you this stuff do they it comes from a book you can read a book by anthony sutton i have the uh, the addresses and so on for his books anthony sutton wrote a book on the order another man called ron rosenbaum those are the only two authors that i know who have ever said anything about the secret society the men involved in it are not allowed to say anything about the society if the word the order comes up with skull and bones they must leave the room immediately they will never discuss it each of these men who join has a secret code name for example george bush the ex-president's name was poppy i don't know what they're going to call george bush jr if he gets the job but i would say he was one of the most likely men to get the job now what they want to do is bring in a new form of government for the world it's called by tony blair the third way it's called by the American politicians reinventing government. Anybody watching this program today, write those two terms down, please. Watch for them on your newspaper. The third way means that to this point in history, most countries have worked on a two system. You've had the, uh, the government and the opposition. But this one is a different one altogether where they bring in big business, which takes the place of the power. They sit in the power chair. Let me quote to you from some articles picked up on the plane on the way over here. This is from the Wall Street Journal. Um, Tuesday night's election debate finally settled the argument. This election is about something more fundamental, the very role of government in the 21st century. There it is. Now, for Republican George W. Bush, the surplus makes it possible not just to provide a tax cut, but to finance a remodeling of the House of Government making it feel smaller and work differently. When the job is done, the government would provide services with the help of market forces. 
These are big business, your multinationals, rather than over the resistance of market forces. And then uh, in the Wall Street Journal, Europe, on the 5th of, September, of um, October, we read here, one thing is clear, the campaign so far isn't offering a clear mandate for either Gore or Bush's vision of the role of government. It's got to do with a change in government. It's called a new world order, where a world government takes the place of all national governments, and they become puppets on strings and do exactly what they're told. Do they realise they're becoming used in that role as puppets, <coughs> or are they, are, they, are they willingly going along with it? They must know. They must know. They can't be stupid. I mean, these people, I'm just waiting for one bold politician to stand up and tell the people what I'm saying. Why should I rush around the world wasting my time explaining all this and studying all this when a politician involved in it knows that this is true? Why doesn't he just get up and say, look, I'm not really running the show. I'm being told what to do. And if I don't do what I'm told, I get the sack. It's as simple as that. Now, let's go a little bit further. I'll make a statement now. The presidents in America are not elected. They are chosen beforehand. That's a bold statement. That's a bold statement. Me. Now, in one of my books, I have the quote here. It says, Ronald Reagan was written up in the Webster's Dictionary as the next president of the United States even before the elections were held. Uh, can that be proved? Yes, it can be. You can, you, can, you can check it up. The, it says the Consul General in Auckland, New Zealand, said, unbelievable. And the publishers of the dictionary had no explanation as to how that took place. So obviously they were well aware who was going to be elected. They knew. And they know already in America who's going to win this one. They know whether it's Bush or Gore. Both men, by the way, are world government people. But my guess is Gore will get it because he... Sorry, Bush. Bush will get it because he belongs to the Skull and Bone Society. At the moment, Gore's ahead in the polls, but I still think Bush will get it. But either way, the, the New World Order Society <coughs> wins. Yes, now... Gets their man in. Now, let's go a little further. I want to go Have further. you ever been sued, Barry? Well, I mean, there's plenty of opportunity to do it because my statements are outrageous. They are. And uh, what about the ones that were made in the first programme about the Masons? I mean, uh, it's quite interesting. Have you not had any repercussions? About well, this? they can't because, I mean, it would simply bring out all this stuff. They don't want people to know all this. They want people to think that their society is concerned with building hospitals, looking after young people and so on. These are good things. But they've never sued you? They, well, they can't. Why? Well, how could they? Because simply all this stuff comes out in the open, you see. And they don't want it to come out in the open. That's the point. I mean, the Salvation Army, they do good things too, but they don't take oaths to cut their throats and rip their chests open and so on. My point is, though, Barry, if, if they haven't sued you, then perhaps what you're saying is true. Well, it would need to be, otherwise I wouldn't be bold enough to say it. Um, let me go a little bit further. I have a, an article at home saying that there is a book being written called Vote Scam. And in America, of course, they're doing the voting system at the moment. It's getting ready for that. And when we had Milosevic go out the other day, I found the answer to how it's done. Now, if this is true, how come Clinton got away with what he did and still was considered to be popular? I know. Now, how did that happen? When they took polls and so on, they said he was still... Now, I said, someone's got to be fiddling with the polls, surely. This is how it was done. I'm reading from the International Herald Tribune, 5th of October in the year 2000, rigged data seen by Milosevic foes. I'll read here. In an interview, Mr. Labus said, the software had flags, the word flags is in inverted commas, that gave operators options to include prefabricated voting totals into otherwise accurate results. He said the Electoral Commission appeared to have counted Mr. Costa Nuka's votes accurately, but added not more than 170,000 votes to Mr. Milosevic's totals. So these are in the system. Now in America, the voting is counted by a private firm, I discovered. And someone's written a book about it. It's called Vote Scam. And when they interviewed the people in charge of this counting system, they said, do you have outside observers coming in, checking on what you're doing? They said, no. Then the interviewer said, well, you have no paper record of all these votes, have you? No, it's all on computers. And this is how it could be done, you see, by using these flags, leaving a space in the computer there so they can put their own results in and choose the man of their choice. It's very, very dangerous indeed. And what we need to do almost is go back to the old paper system where you can recheck the paper counting of the votes, you see. But the computers are very dangerous things to work with. If you're clever enough, you can fiddle the system.
So how are we ever going to know what the truth is as regards to elections then in a democracy? Well, in a democracy, you can no longer trust the system because the people who are pulling the strings in the background are controlling more than we realise. And this is all to bring really to uh, head um, a, a conspiracy for bringing the new world government order in? Yes, it is. So all these people are, are as it were, being groomed and brought in and put in line in, in, the, in the right positions of government, et cetera, or leadership? Yes, they are. Now, let's recognise, too, that the people who are organising all this are not, or not evil people. I mean, not, they're not out to do an evil thing. They really feel this is a good way to go. We're, we're all brothers and sisters. We sell out our assets. We become under one head. And naturally, we can't fight each other because you may have an asset I need and I have an asset you need. It's called interdependence. Very clever plan. And uh, that's taking place right now. So this is part of the globalisation? It's globalisation, yes. Can you just briefly outline your perspective on that? Well, my country, New Zealand, as you well know, was well known for lamb and so on and dairy products. Not now. They're driving the sheep off the land. They're driving away the cattle. They're planting pine trees everywhere. Our country is now responsible for pine logs because we grow them quicker there than anywhere in the world apart from Chile, which is on the same hemisphere, the same latitude. Uh, then Australia, our next door neighbour, was well known for steel and uh, sheep meat, wool. Not now. They're closing down the steel mills and wool and gong in Newcastle. They're driving the sheep off the land. They're putting them in pits in the ground and shooting them by the million. I've actually seen photographs and video clips of that happening. Cutting down on the food supplies and also getting rid of sheep. Australia is now responsible for wheat for the southern hemisphere and so on. So the aim of the exercise is this. If we want something, we have to go to another country to get it. We're all brothers. We cannot fight each other. Interdependency. The new world order will bring about love in the hearts of men and women. They will no longer fight one another. All wishful things. It's a, it's a very good, positive uh, Sounds step good. forward. Sounds good. What's the danger? The danger is the word of God tells me the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? He says, I, the Lord, I understand. There's only one person who could bring about a world government, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. Any other system will fail, believe me. And we are told exactly in the Word of God how long it will last, three and a half years under the power of this great world leader, Antichrist. You remember we read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, that at a certain time in history, the prophets said there would be a world leader arise who would bring about a new world monetary system. I want to speak about that in this program. But also I discovered that there was another phrase used there, the mystery of iniquity. That's in verse 7. Now, the mystery of iniquity we now understand is simply the takeover of the world by Luciferian groups who are determined to get rid of the nation state and set up an, an interdependent world government where every country relies upon everybody else uh, to keep the show going. In essence, that's a very good uh, thing to do, isn't it, for the benefit of the whole mankind? Oh, yes, it sounds really good. Now, if I didn't have the book here, <laughs> I, I would know the end result of all this. It sounds good, but the scriptures also say there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Man planning without God cannot possibly get things right, because God is the only one who knows how to put things together properly. After all, he made the place. He should know how to run it. Now, when I look at the scriptures, I find this is the only book that speaks with authority about where we came from, what we're doing here, and where we're going to. And then I hear of a group in America who is involved in this world government plan uh, called the Trilateral Commission, run by David Rockefeller. Now, his plan was to divide the world into three regions. And here are the regions. First of all, Europe, with their own economic system called the Euro, and their own standing army. That would include Africa and a few other countries as well. The other group was uh, America, the Americas from the northern tip of Alaska down to the tip of South America, using the American dollar as their currency and their own standing army. Now, this is the one that interests me. <clears throat> the Asia and the Pacific region have been linked together. That's where I come from. And I could never work out why, when I watched CNN News, I had to wait for the Asian edition to find out what was happening on my side of the world. The, read, the news was always read to me by an Asian commentator. I thought, this is funny. And then I learned that we were having meetings regularly in that part of the world called APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. And I discovered that New Zealand and Australia are now considered, under the world government auspices, part of Asia. But we are part of Asia. Let me read to you now a prophecy from 
Revelation 17, verse 19. The final world government setup is called Mystery Babylon. And I'm reading to you from verse 19. And the great city was divided into three parts. There it is. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God. There's the scripture. Babylon will be divided into three parts. When was this predicted? 96 AD. And it's happening in the year 2000. There's another prophecy. Then I discovered, it just goes on and on and on, I discovered that there would be a world monetary system that would be the roof on the world government house. Do you remember? We talked about that in the last program. The foundation, 1776, Illuminati, the, the authors of the seals on the American dollar. 1987, the framework for the house went up in New Zealand. The whole world is now following the New Zealand plan, including Tony Blair, who has been down there looking at the situation. Germany's following it, Papua New Guinea's following it, everybody is following the New Zealand plan. Uh, then we had the electrician come in, the Y2K problem was designed and executed at the end of 1999 and now the whole system is wired. Every computer has been set up and made compatible, ready for the electronic monetary system that's coming in. Now we need a monetary crash, which Alan Greenspan is speaking of already. He's saying we know it's going to come, we're not quite sure when, but they're going to crash the whole world economy shortly. And of course, a big earthquake such as they had in Japan yesterday, 7.1 on the Richter scale, if that hits Tokyo, the whole of Tokyo will fall into the sea because Tokyo is built around the harbour on sand. And the whole thing will just shiver away and that will be the finish of the world economy. Within one hour? Japanese yen goes down. Within one hour, they withdraw their investments from every other country around the world to rebuild Tokyo and that will bring about the world collapse of monetary system. So. When that happens, we then see the mark of the beast comes in, and that was spoken of in Revelation 13, 16 to 18. Let me read. Written in 96 AD, by the way. And he causes all, here's your Antichrist, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or their foreheads. No man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And the number we know is verse 18. What is it? 666. There it is, 666. Six digits on the computer for your birthday, six digits on the computer for your location or mesh block, and six digits for your ID. Howard, I've got it in my pocket. Have a look at this. Here's the final one. New Zealand first again. They've given us a digitalized driver's license. Here, have a look at this one. There it is. Now, if you don't get one of those in my country now, this is what happens to you. They catch you, your car is confiscated on the spot, you have to walk home, your car is gone until you get one of those licenses. Is that stringent? That's the way it is. I've never heard of such a thing. It was suddenly forced upon us. 750,000 New Zealanders are rebelling against it at the moment and they say we will not receive one. When they get pulled up by a traffic cop, their car is confiscated, they say we don't care. They go off and buy another one for $200 and the police yards are packed full of confiscated cars now because people are, don't want to go along with this system. How does this relate to the 666? Here's the problem. The problem is that that photograph is digital. The signature is digital. And when I went to receive that license, I had to look into a box now and they photographed my iris. I've got no doubt about that. The iris is photographed. And, and it's unique. unique. Everyone's unique. iris is unique. Unique. When I come to London now, as soon as I walk through the airport at Heathrow, they can have that picture sent ahead of me and as I come through they'll say, here comes Barry Smith. Do you get the idea? Yep. Every country on earth can receive my photograph on the computer because it's now digitalised. Now that is a wicked system. There's their ID. But the, the benefits to something like this from a government point of view is that they can track criminals. Of course they can. And they could be alerted very quickly in another country that they're about to receive somebody who perhaps they don't want to receive. Well, there's always got to be a good side, otherwise people won't go along with it. Exactly, and that's the subtlety of it all, isn't that's it? That's the subtlety of it all. Can, can I just say that, yes. thank you Barry, yes. first for that, that the book of Revelation, it, to set the scene really here, because we're reading scriptures from here and some people might say, well, so what? You know, it's an yeah. old book, it's an ancient book. But Revelation is quite unique in chapter 1 of verse 3, it says, Blessed is he who reads aloud the words of these prophecies. Yes. Okay. All right. So we are going to benefit by understanding the prophecies that are in here. Not only the readers, but the hearers as well. 
and those who listen to the words. Now, this is good because, I mean, over the years, as an ex-school teacher of 15 years' experience, I've been criticised up hill and down dale for speaking on these things. Even Christian people get upset with the stuff that I bring out. And I they bet say, they do. Well, I say, why do you do it? I said, listen. They don't want to rock the comfort <laughs> zone, do you? I said, one third of the Bible is prophecy. And it just happens I got into it, and I believe I had a divine revelation that I should do this. I've told the story in my previous visit here, a supernatural encounter in the island of Rarotonga, to write down the things I had learnt and so others could read it and run and tell others. Now, I get letters continually from all over the world, from Tibet and all over the place, people who've got so angry they've read my books, thrown them in the fire, suddenly changed their mind, pulled them out of the fire, beat out the flames, read the last page and asked Jesus into their lives, you see. Because for the first time in history, I told my children that we are living in an age when we can now prove the Bible is the Word of God. Revelation 19.10 says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. If what the Bible says predicted comes true, then the rest of it must be true also. We must be born again. And here's your money system coming in, Mark of the Beast. I've got it here. Let me show you. It's a silicon chip. I'm now showing you, Howard, a silicon chip inside a plastic block. Mm -hmm. I'll show That's you. That's right in the centre there, right? Yeah, the little chip is in the centre. Here is a blow-up of the thing. Look at this one. It's a little glass tube with electronics inside it. There it is. They're using it on dogs and cats and fish and birds and horses. Injecting and it. Injected it. Here's the injector. Look at it. Mm -hmm. We're actually looking at this. I, Very tiny, then. Oh. Now, if you want to know who the dog is, you simply use this thing here, a scanner. There's the scanner. Mm -hmm. You go like this, scan. The message comes from the dog, from the chip, and implanted in its neck. You push the button, read. You read his name is Rover. Uh, he's owned by Mr. and Mrs. Brown, 16 King Street, uh, you know, somewhere in London. And the telephone number is there. These people want to go now quickly on beyond animals to human beings. And I can prove this in any meeting. I've got a bag full of information. This is an identity chip. It's an identity chip. Now, this is going to progress into... It's progressing into a people identification as spoken of in the Word of God. So we're living in the days when this prophecy is literally being fulfilled. Now, it's the right hand or the forehead that's been reserved. That's what it says here, right hand or forehead. This is chapter what again? Uh, Revelation 13, 16 to 18. Some people believe the mark of the beast is the keeping of Sunday. In, in, uh, in opposition to Saturday. That's not the point of the argument. It's to do with buying and selling. This has total control mm -hmm. uh, of one's l life, really, because yes. if you cannot buy to buy food mm. you, to eat to supply for your family, which we take for granted every day, we can go down yes. to the shops and buy something. If you're not going to be in a position, and you, if you like, you're going to be singled out because you don't have this mark, if you, um, you will suffer the consequences. That, so it's a difficult one, isn't it? How, how are we going to escape this? Uh, the, only, the only way that people can escape this is to recognise a basic principle. Here's the principle. The whole thing starts, of course, the whole problem starts with these seals on the dollar here. If this is a spiritual problem, which it is, that's the eye of Lucifer or Satan, we must go back to that point and find the answer there. If the problem is spiritual, the answer is also spiritual. Don't try and fight this problem in the flesh. The answer is to let people know because we have a spiritual problem, we need a spiritual answer. It is in Jesus Christ, a, a, a relationship with him, not a religion. Religion never changed anybody for the good. A relationship does. Jesus said, you must be born again. And at the end of every one of our public meetings, I give the invitation, people come to the front, they make a public declaration of their faith in Christ. It is a covenant done in the presence of, of men and women. God himself and the angels watch as well, of course. They pray a simple prayer like this, Lord Jesus, I come to the cross where you died for me. Three things, I repent of my sin. I turn away from my old selfish life, living only for myself, and I turn to Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus, for my life of sin to this point. Number two, I believe your blood is enough. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. Yours is enough for me. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Number three, I open the door to my life and receive Christ. The Bible says to as many as receive him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. Thank you, Barry. Uh, join us again next week so that you can get a better understanding of world events and how it affects us. Please stay tuned. 
You're watching Revelation, understanding world events from the past to the present and into the future. My guest today again is author and teacher Barry Smith. He's written several books, mainly focusing on the New World Order. Barry has many years of studying about eschatology, that is, understanding end time prophecies, and again is going to talk to us about how the New World Order fits in perfectly with biblical prophecies which are having fulfillment before our very eyes. Barry, we talked about many things over the last few programs, but I'd like you to uh, really perhaps time maybe to defend yourself because you've been deemed by many to be quite outrageous in your comments. And I'll give you an example, the International Monetary Fund, it's sort of interfering in global affairs through uh, lending money to, to countries and governments. What, what has been the significance of that? Well, the key was it, it, every, everybody likes receiving money, there's no doubt about that. The love of money is the root of all evil, First Timothy chapter 6. But the fact is that the International Monetary Fund uses the money as a weapon to almost surreptitiously force governments to sign conditions that they don't really understand. How, do, how does that come about? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm personally friendly with the president of Kenya, President Moy, and he, he comes to my meetings. He tells me, he said, you know what you're saying is so true. They put these terrible conditions on us. If we want the money, we have to do this and that and restructure our economy, which makes it more difficult for our people and so on. That's the problem. Now, the people of the world have just discovered these things are happening and they're getting angry, masses of people, thousands of them. But it's interesting, in the year 2000, I see protests everywhere in Seattle. You've got another group called the World Trade Organization. The IMF couldn't catch China. They wouldn't get caught up in those conditions. Those Asians are fairly clever, you know. They just wouldn't go along with the plan because they know as soon as you borrow from the IMF, you sign the conditions. China said, no, thank you. We don't, we'll plug along as we are. Um, Mahatia has also resisted the IMF. They said, we don't want you. We don't want to sell up our sovereignty to you people. We see what you're up to. That's the key then, it's the sovereignty. It's selling up sovereignty. But do they, do, they don't recognise it as being that dangerous, do they, they at the people time? People don't realise as a rule until they look into it and see the end result. Uh, I said, who else has not got caught up in this thing? They said, Singapore. They haven't gone along with it either. But most people have. Now, the danger is that people don't see the problem, they borrow the money, don't realise there's a sting in the tail, and the sting in the tail is signing up the conditions later on which are forced on each country. And once you fulfil the conditions, you absolutely suck the sovereignty and the life out of that country. Now, to catch China, what did they do? They caught them up in the World Trade Organisation, which is very similar. You simply set conditions there, you join the WTO, now we see people around the world have protested in Seattle. It was called the Battle in Seattle. They got so angry, they fought in the streets, there was tear gas and so on. Then they moved the problem to the battle to Washington, D.C. The International Monetary Fund had a meeting. They had a big fight there with protesters. They then went down to Melbourne, Australia just recently. There was a big economic meeting there held in the casino in Melbourne. They protested there and some of our politicians from New Zealand went across and took part in the protest against the policies of the world government people. Now they've had another one in Prague, I believe, and these protests will continue and continue and continue as more people understand the evil nature of what is taking place in the world today. It finishes up that some people are going to be the, the, uh, the top men. It's going to be like a feudal system where you have the lords and the serfs and the majority of people around the world will be the serfs living under the new world order. Who is actually protesting then? The people who are protesting are students, are people who are involved in trade unionism. That's all part of it, of course. Trade unions have to go uh, because no more collective bargaining under the new world order. So it's more a dictatorship. It's like a dictatorship. And that's what's happened in Australia. It's happening in England. It's knocking the power out of the trade... Is that true, out of the trade unions? Well, yes, uh, that's been been done in you know, the last 20 years. Arthur Scargill and so on, shut down 30 coal mines here with the loss of 30,000 jobs, you see. The, the MUA, the Maritime Union of Australia, some of the biggest strikers in the world, they've had all their power sucked away. But going back to this, the, the IMF's uh, manipulation of, of our governments, uh, can you just explain you know, how this happens, because this is this, <coughs> it's very subtle. Well, it's, it's so subtle. Normally speaking, we were doing very well in 1961 when the IMF came to our country. Let's use, use New Zealand as a test case here. We had so many jobs going, we were looking for people to come from overseas to take up employment in New Zealand to help us out. We had so many jobs. 
As soon as we borrowed from the IMF, we upset the balance of the economic system of New Zealand and we began to go rapidly downhill. And today, we have so many people unemployed, it's unbelievable. The same in Australia, same here in this country. As soon as you borrow, you upset the balance of what is really going on. But the IMF, does it not uh, ask you to tax your people like we have VAT? Yes. OK, it introduces a tax. That's right. Um, which really there's nothing that the governments who are up for election can do anything about. No, they have to do it. They have to do it, right? Yep. Because it's all part of the IMF ruling, right? Well, it's called VAT here. It's called in New Zealand uh, uh, GST, Goods and Services Tax. Now, when John Howard was told by the Mont Pelerin Society the other day from London to bring a GST into Australia, Goods and Services Tax, which is akin to VAT, he didn't want to. He, and then he suddenly changed his tune. He said... We, we'll, we won't call it GST, he was calling it taxation reform. And I heard this dear little man, they call him Honest John, you know, I heard Honest John say to the Australians on television, every Australian is looking for taxation reform. And I thought, that's funny, I've walked the streets of Australia for years and I have never ever heard one Aussie say to another, oh, how I long for tax reform. What a lot of nonsense. So using the words taxation reform, it's a misnomer. Mis reform means to make better. But the reforms that they have introduced have not made things better. And in order to bring in goods and services tax in Australia, they called on David Longy, the ex-Prime Minister of New Zealand, who was an expert at it. And they said, help us bring it in. And this is what he said. If you want to bring in a tax like that, you have to get your fingers into their pockets without disturbing their trousers. <laughs> that was the phrase he used. And sure enough, they brought it in. And the Aussies are so angry as they brought in this new tax because that's been forced upon them as well. This is a world system, Howard, and we must recognise that at the moment we're living at the end of the system. It's going to be introduced worldwide shortly, and they want the plan brief, basically set up by the end of this year. Right. So how does this fit in with Bible prophecy? Then? Bible prophecy calls this the mystery of iniquity, the subjug subjugation of every country under some power that controls it. And I think it was one of the old men of Rothschild's family said years ago, if you want to control a nation, control the monetary system of that nation. And that's how they're doing it. This pyramid at Giza is a very important uh, thing. As far as God is concerned, it is his symbol. And in the book of Isaiah 19 and verse 19, we read there what the pyramid is all about. I am now explaining why there is a pyramid on the back of the American dollar. It has to do with this one world government concept, you see. Isaiah 19 and verse 19 reads like this. In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt. Number two, and a pillar at the border thereof unto the Lord. Number three, it shall be for a sign, number four, and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. One of the seven wonders of the world, we have visited this place two or three times already, and we should be there again next week, God willing. Um, the pyramid was designed on the pi principle. I've done a bit of a study on this. Most people who went, did maths at school will know that. And uh, the pi principle was so cleverly worked out with this system that only a master mathematician could have designed it. The Japanese tried to build one similar, and I speak of the Great Pyramid at Giza, which was not built by Egyptians, but was built by strangers in the land of Egypt. At what period was that? Uh, oh, it must have been 5,000 years ago. So quite clever men. Oh, clever. And when they built this thing, they built it in a certain way and they built it in a certain area. It, it's, the Bible says it's a sign, it's a witness, it's an altar, it's a, it's a post to the Lord. It's a symbol of God mm -hmm. in the middle of the land of Egypt. Now, very quickly, I have all this documented in my book, The Devil's Jigsaw here. Um, it was put in such a position that it faces exactly north, south, east and west. Very, very little movement in it. One of the seven wonders of the world. If you scribe a line from the base of that out to the east, it takes you through the spot where Moses crossed the Red Sea with the children of Israel. This is called the Christ line. It takes you through the town of Bethlehem where Jesus was born, and it takes you through the Jordan River where Joshua crossed with the children of Israel. Only God could have designed such a position that that could take place. If you get on top of the pyramid, it has no capstone. They can't find the capstone. That's missing. They've never seen it. They don't know where it is, but I will explain that in just a moment. If you sat on top of the pyramid with a giant compass and did a scribe around the coast of Egypt on the Mediterranean, you would touch every point. And if you scribe right around in a circle, you would cover the whole of Egypt 
and you'll find that the pyramid is exactly on the border of north and south Egypt unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. Uh, <clears throat> we also learned inside there are passages. We have the ascending passage and the descending passage. They are symbols of the truth of God. The descending passage finishes in the pit, which is a symbol of hell or Hades. The ascending passage finishes in the king's chamber, which is a symbol of heaven. The upward journey through, from the cross of Jesus leads to heaven. The downward journey leads to hell. As you go up the upward passage, the ascending passage, they use a scale, uh, people who study this, of one inch to a year. And they find the whole history of the world is in those passages. So they move up the passage, you find a date when Moses was given the law by God on Mount Sinai. You find the birth of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the crucifixion. You find World War I, World War II, and so on. You get to the top of the ascending passage, and you find uh, uh, the king's chamber goes across it. And when you look at it, it's in the form of a cross, you see. There's the ascending passage. The king's chamber goes across like that. There is the cross. Inside the king's chamber, there is an empty sarcophagus or, or uh, tomb, and there's no lid on it. And that speaks of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That bit thing is so heavy, it's made of stone, cut out of stone, cannot be moved out of the building because it was put in there before the building was finished construction, being constructed. Marvellous, you see, God's symbols. Now, here's the exciting point. The capstone is missing. One day I was in the office, excuse me, and I said to my office manager, can you photostat this for me, please? And I'd like to show you this. In the book of Genesis chapter 10 and verse 25, I want to read you a scripture here. I'm answering the question, why is there a pyramid on the back of the American dollar? Genesis 10, 25 goes on to say this. <clears throat> here we go. Uh, and unto Eber were born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for in his days was the earth divided. Now what does that mean? How do you divide the earth? We discovered that the pyramid was placed in such a position in Egypt that it had to be God who arranged where it would be put. Center. Center. Because the land area to the northwest is the same as the land area to the northeast, is the same as the land area to the southwest, is the same as the land area to the southeast. There it is. It divides the world in land area. Could it be done any other way? It couldn't be done any other any way. Any other part of the world no to become centre? No, it had to be there. Had it been taken south to the equator, it would have been too much seawater there and the, the land area... So it's not in land mass? It's land doing. mass only. Okay. Now, only God could have designed it. Now, here's the problem. I thought to myself, why is that on the back of the dollar? Then I thought, obviously, if that eye is the eye of Lucifer, which it is, above the pyramid, that's the capstone trying to take the place of the true capstone who was Jesus Christ. We then turn to 1 Peter. This is the Word of God now in the New Testament. And we discover the following about the stone that the builders rejected. Every time I go to Egypt, I say to the guides, where's the capstone? They say, we don't know, sir. We're now reading from 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm reading verse 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious, that's Jesus, and unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. Mm -hmm. Now, when I was a boy, I went to Sunday school, as a number of us went to Sunday school, I believe. I hope you did. And while I was there, they taught me that when buildings were built in England years ago, they always started with a cornerstone. The, the lay of the cornerstone, and Foundation then you built the building on that level, you see. Now, the point is, that when I read this verse that I've just read in my wife's language in Psalm 1, she comes from the island of Psalm 1, I speak that language, this is what it said, which means the cornerstone, which means the cornerstone is also the capstone. And I saw for the first time what it means. Lucifer, or Satan, is trying to run this whole world government and he wants to be the capstone of history. He will only run it for three and a half years, the prophets say. At that end of that period, Jesus Christ, the true capstone, will come back. He will come back from heaven on a white horse. You'll find this in Revelation 19. He will grab Lucifer by the throat, rip him off the top of the pyramid, throw him into the lake of fire, and he himself will be the cornerstone and the capstone. He is the first and the last. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the alpha, the omega. He that started it will finish it. And I'm saying today with full assurance of faith, 
Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and soon he will take his position as King of this world. Zechariah 14.9 says, And the Lord shall be King over all the earth, and in that day his name shall be one. The key to the coming of the Lord is not so much Israel as the city of Jerusalem. Everybody wants Jerusalem. Who wants it? Israel says it's their eternal capital. The Palestinians want it. The Arabs want it. If there is any difference between a Palestinian and an Arab, some ask the question. The Roman Catholic Church wants it. The Orthodox Church wants it. The Freemasons want it. Everybody's got their eyes on Jerusalem. And when we read in the book of Zechariah, chapter 12, we can understand now what all the fuss and bother is about. We're supposed to be there next week, by the way. This will be trip number 18. Wow. We go every year taking tours from Australia and New Zealand. But I'm quoting now from Zechariah the prophet, chapter 12 and verse 3. Very clear. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Now there's something about Jerusalem. In verse 9, another verse, chapter 12 and verse 9, it shall come to pass in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against, not Israel, Jerusalem, the city of God. This is the battle of Armageddon that it's Yeah, it will to. be. It's the Armageddon. Now, as we stand at the moment, people who've been watching the media will know that there's a lot of fighting, going, stones flying everywhere and so on. This has been going on for years, Intifada and so on. But this one looks to be quite serious. And I suspect that maybe the Hegelian dialectic is being fulfilled in the land of Israel. Now the, now the group that George Bush belongs to, this is George Bush Jr., his father, George Bush Sr., and the, and the grandfather, called the Order, a, a German society, works out of Yale University, a very highly secret group, more powerful than the Freemasons even, dedicated to a one world government, follow the philosophies of a German philosopher called Hegel, H-E-G-E-L. It's called the Hegelian dialectic. They divide the world into two groups, each country into two groups, um, opposing one another. One's called thesis, the other one's antithesis. At a certain time in history, they dictate the situation where the two groups come together and they call that synthesis, E-G. Uh, thesis, America, antithesis, USSR deadly enemies, Ronald Reagan, Gorbachev. The next minute you see Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan, arms around each other, having a photograph taken. They are now Gorby and Ronnie. What's going on? What's going on? The Hegelian dialectic is now setting up the headquarters for the new world order. That is the dialectic being shown to us. We then move to South Africa. We have Thesis, ANC, Nelson Mandela, Antithesis, the Zulus, Butelezi. There's no chance they will ever come together. Henry Kissinger and a few friends go over there, whisper a word in their ear. The next minute they have what is called the New South Africa, a peace deal has been signed. We then have a look at places like Ireland, no chance of peace there between the Unionists and the IRA and so on. The next minute we have a, a group of people go across to that country from America, whisper in their ear, they have some sort of a peace between the two. There's one last area they want to work on and that is the Middle East, thesis, Israel, antithesis Arabs and at a certain time in history I guess after some sort of a war there would be peace. I'm wondering Howard whether what is happening there now will not lead to a war in the Middle East out of which will come the peace treaty. Now this is again biblical prophecy. Yes it is. Isn't it? The, it is. the peace treaty was talked about thousands of years ago as coming about. Wasn't Daniel it? chapter 9 27. Now this man Hegel from the Hegelian philosophy says this, there can be no change in history without a conflict. In other words, the Gulf War that was organized before George Bush organized the New World Order was the conflict that would bring about the New World Order. You get the idea? You had to have the conflict first. Now let's read Daniel 9:27. It says there, referring to the great world leader called Antichrist, uh, what verse is it? Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27. All right, the very last Let's one. Let's read it. And he, referring to Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant, there's your peace treaty, for one week. The word there, week, is heptad in Hebrew, stands for seven years. And in the midst of the week, in other words, after three and a half years, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. In other words, this great world leader, the prophecy tells us, will confirm a seven-year treaty with the Jews and the Arabs, 
It must come out of a battle situation, according to the Hegelian dialectic. And at that point, we then, that sets the stage for the return of the Jewish Messiah, whom we know to be the Lord Jesus Christ. They rejected him the first time, but they will receive him when he comes back, according to the book of Romans, chapter 11 and verse 25. At this moment of history, we are living in a period called the times of the Gentiles. A non-Jew is a Gentile, I'm one. And last time I was in Israel last year, I took a group of pastors with me from New Zealand. The Israeli government gave us a free trip. It was wonderful. We, I was allowed to take five friends with me. Free hotels, free airfares. Mm -hmm. And while we were there, I called one of my friends there to come up to Jerusalem and meet with us in the hotel. These two travel agents sat opposite me and I looked at them. I said, you two men are secular Jews. You're not religious. I know that. I said, we are Gentiles. We are non-Jews. The Word of God tells me that our period is coming to an end. The times of the Gentiles was 2,000 years in length. We are now 2,000 years from Christ. Our period is running out. And wasn't it Jesus who actually said himself that <clears throat> predicted that the Gentiles would trample upon Jerusalem for this particular period of time? And this, when that came to an end, yep. then what was going to happen? That's the point. Now that verse that you quoted was Luke 21, verse 24b says this, And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. That was fulfilled in June 1967 when Israel took over the whole city of Jerusalem for the first time in 2,500 years. Well, what about the fact that they didn't get back the temple site? Ah, all right. Well, our time ran out there, the times of the Gentiles. But God also gave us another little period called the fullness of the Gentiles, and we read that in Romans chapter 11:25. So I quoted this to these two secular travel agents. They were shocked. These are not religious people. These are money men, you know, uh, economic men. Mm -hmm. They're there for a, for a, for a shekel. Um, and we're reading this verse, Romans 11:25. I would not, brethren, you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. The times of the Gentiles ran out in 1967 in June. Another little period now has been added. We are living in that period now called the fullness of the Gentiles. And anybody who's watching this program today who is a Gentile, I want you to know your time is running out. You're living at the end of a period that God has given to us to give our lives to Christ who died for us. Jesus is God. God himself, veiled in the flesh, get, shed his blood. What for? To get us to heaven. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sin. And then anyway, I said to these men, you find it hard to understand us. Why? Because temporary blindness is upon most of you. But very shortly, God is going to whip the blindness off you, and you will be more powerful than us. Right, because the blindness only came upon them so that the Gentiles could actually see the truth about who God was and that all his plans and purposes were for our benefit as well as the Jews. Correct. It is so important that we understand the significance of Israel, Jerusalem and the Jewish people and they have not been rejected. They in fact are going to pick up the baton, I believe, from the Christian church. We need to support them. But then Barry, there's also the issue of God's heart for the Arabs. Let me add to this then, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, from what you're saying is good because it fits in with the final part of my story. These men sat dumbfounded. They're travel agents. <laughs> and I suggested to them they'd be more powerful than we would because unto them were given all the promises of God. I said, you have the, the oracles of God. You were the first ones to get the scriptures. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born in your country. He walked your streets. He preached in your streets. He was crucified in your country. He went to heaven from Israel. He comes back to Israel, and he will reign from Israel. You have all the advantages. Said that. Now, I said, do you men remember the story in Ezekiel about the Valley of Dry Bones? They said, yes. So here we go. The bones came from various quarters. That was all the Jews coming back from all over the world, 1917. Then it says God put skin and sinews on them. That was 1948, May the 14th. Israel became a nation under David Ben-Gurion. I said, there's only one more thing got to happen to you people. He said, what is that? God is going to breathe on you and you will stand up a mighty nation and the promises of God will go back to you again. We've had our opportunity. Do you understand? They said, yes. I said, I've got nothing more to say to you. That's why I called you up from Tel Aviv to talk to me. That's the message I'm giving you now. 
And I'm telling you, Howard, we're living at the end of the period. Now, here's some good news. Any Arab who is listening to what we're saying today may think we are pro-Israel and anti-Arab. That is not the point. When we turn to the prophecy in Isaiah 19, and I want to conclude on this, it's so lovely, it says that God loves all these people in the Middle East. He has plans for all the children of Israel, although the promise of the Messiah will come through the seed, singular, of David, not seeds, plural. Right. And so the, the deliverer comes not through the Arabs, but through the Jews. That was God's thing. I'm not going to argue. I don't want any Jew to argue, nor any Arab to argue. Just listen to what he says and be blessed. Now, this is the blessing here. We read, at the end of this age, we're living near that end now, Isaiah 19 and verse 23. Let's read it. In that day, when the Messiah comes back, there shall be a highway out of Egypt into Assyria. Assyria, by the way, is Syria and Iraq, Saddam Hussein's country. Okay, so there's going to be a highway right across through there. And the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. That means all the people in between, Arabs and Jews, will all be involved. Verse 24, In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. 25, Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, that's the Arab groups, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. I want you to know that God loves everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we do not try and set the stage for the return of Jesus. We humble ourselves. We read the scriptures. We read the newspaper day by day. We put them together and we say, thank you, Lord. We do understand these things for you have given us wisdom. It says the wise shall understand. Bless you, brother. Thank you very much, Barry. Thanks, Howard. The views expressed in the Revelation programs are not necessarily the views of Revelation TV. For further information on this or other programs, please go to our website, rtv.uk.com or telephone 0208 255 3333. We are interested in your comments and welcome any biblically based questions that you may have. Address your emails to comments at rtv.uk.com. Thank you.